Okay, I think we should we should make a, a gentle start, Mike. What do you think? Yeah, very happy to do that. Lovely. So welcome everybody to Tea Tuesday. This is the fifth in our series of Tea Tuesday events. Uh, my name's Hilary Woodhead. I am Napa's Executive Director, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my dear friend, Mike Phillips. We're going to have a chat and a coffee this afternoon, um, and we're going to be talking about this, this really important issue, uh, an issue that's close to both of our hearts around the engagement needs of LGBTQ plus residents in care homes. So it is my it is my pleasure to welcome you, Mike. Mike is a leadership consultant with a special interest in dementia care, social care, and equality. Mike, hi. How are you doing? Hello. I'm good, thank you. And I feel so privileged to uh, join in the illustrious company of some of your previous guests. <laughs> Some of them are, are, are friends of mine as well. So it's really lovely. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, thank you very much for being here. So what I thought I thought we'd start really with a with a reflecting a little bit on on why this is such an important issue. Why why have we come together this afternoon? Okay, well, um there's so much to say. So I've got some notes, so I might look down. Yeah. Um, but we've 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 come a hugely long way in, in recent years. So some of us may think that we are a more inclusive society and an accepting of difference. Mm -hmm. And so much has been achieved in my lifetime, lots of changes of patterns, but I think we just need to look at, um, I'm giving it away now, but I'm a, a Strictly fan. And uh, on, on, on uh, Sunday, I noticed that there had been complaints already online about Strictly because there'd been an excerpt from a show which was actually about drag queens and there was a complaint because men were in dresses and I thought really and truly you know we've not really got there yet we've still got a long way to go even though we've come a long time and I think it's 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 important to remember things like it's it wasn't until 1992 that the World Health Organization declassified homosexuality as a psychiatric disorder. As recently as 1987, 1987, Virginia Bottomley MP was still advocating ECT, electric shock treatment, as a potential cure for homosexuality. And in 1975, the last lobotomy to, to cure homosexuality was undertaken in the UK. And, and even now in 2020, there are still people arguing for conversion therapy. So I think it's important in the same way, you know, I've been to all these, these sessions, as you know, and, and as Chino was saying uh, a, a few sessions back in terms of Black Lives Matter and Black History Month, we're still learning as a society that we need to be more open to ideas, and cult our own experience. So LGBT inclusivity for me is not just about having a rainbow flag and saying everyone is welcome. It involves being aware of our own unconscious bias um, and our understanding that we need to understand the experiences, particularly of older LGBT community um, because their experiences is very often what creates a fear of moving into care. Um, and of course, it's important because legally, uh, under the Equality Act, uh, it, uh, sexual orientation is one of the protected characteristics. And um, of course, it's a human right, but it's also covered in the Human Rights Act. So there's a legal requirement, an ethical and moral requirement, I think. Um, and it's about having professional ethical practice in our workplaces and really going, I think our friend Danuta is, is, is tuned in and she'll be very familiar with the work of the psychologist Carl Rogers, who talked about unconditional positive regard. Yeah. And that's, that's yeah. easier said than done. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's for me, I'd like to say, you know, as, as a, a white man, I cannot experience, ex understand the experience of black people and their lived experience, but I can listen, I can learn and hopefully empathize. 
um, and in the same way, I, you know, with heterosexual people, uh, you might not understand the experience of LGBT people, and that's not your fault, um, but you can listen and learn and adapt our practice uh, to make sure that we can promote inclusivity. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mike. I think, you know, from a from Napa's point of view, and we were we were having a chat about this recently, weren't we? That, you know, from our point of view, we're all about making sure that people are able to engage, that they're able to spend time doing the things that matter to them um, and doing things that they can that are meaningful and purposeful. But actually, we can't get to that point of engagement until we make a connection until we understand or go some way towards understanding. Listening is that first step, isn't it? To understanding somebody's experience. So I think it's really important to recognize, yes, the legal framework, our moral obligations, all of those things. But it's also from in terms of connection, in terms of being able to spend time authentically with somebody, we really need to kind of listen, don't we, to, to what's important to them and what helps them to feel safe and comfortable and all those things that, that you've just mentioned. Um, so in terms Definitely, of and I think, and I think, so I was just going to say, for, for me, it is all about connection and, and, um, I'm an associate with Meaningful Care Matters, uh, and we talk a lot through our work, um, in training around dementia care about, you know, creating these meaningful connections. That's what, for me, what drives me, that's my passion in, in dementia care. Absolutely, absolutely. So in terms of kind of the lived experience, what might be some of the, the lived experiences of the, the older people that we are likely to come into contact with in residential care, in dementia care? You know, what, what are some of those lived experiences that we might need to be aware of? Right, well, I mean, I was thinking about this, this earlier and you know, I, I know that we, we, we're talking a little bit about from, from the potential, from the position of engagement and, and activities, but I think we, it's all actually for me, it's about looking through the telescope at the other end. Um, and because we, we, we can't do anything to be inclusive until we understand those lived experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. I wouldn't normally disclose these things if I were training, but I'm a white gay man, I mean, it's obvious I'm white, but I'm a gay man, I'm in my 50s. I know I may not look weird, like I'm in my 50s, but I am. Um, I've lived with HIV for 30 years. I was told I'd live for, for less than a year, but I'm still here. Um, so some of, it, some of the things I like to share come from my own experience, uh, as I described those things, but also, um, it's important to say that I cannot speak on behalf of all LGBT plus people. Uh, it's only my experience and those that I've met uh, through my work as a trainer, as a consultant. And um, obviously, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what the experience of a black gay man is because that's not been my lived experience. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of stories, though, through the years, through my own personal life and, and also through my work, as I say, and um, Sally Knocker, who's been a previous guest and I, we worked together many years ago uh, with a project called Opening Doors, uh, Opening Doors London now, uh, which was part of, of UK. And, and we decided, it was supposed to be evaluating the project, but we also decided to hear people's stories. And, you know, some of those stories are really what we need to think about if we're going to be inclusive. Yeah. Um, some women did not want to meet a man and some men didn't want to meet with a woman as that's why we had a man and a woman doing the evaluation. There was a woman whose partner, they'd come out of a pub, a gang approached them. She was, her girlfriend was raped in very grisly details, which I won't share here, and murdered in front of her. That is the sorts of hatred that people have experienced in their lives. There have been transgender individuals who have often been the ones, you know, protecting everybody else in a gay venue, but then being more visible would leave the venue and be beaten up because their difference was very visible. Whilst they were you know, prepare, trying to uh, protect, you know, a, a, a pub from bricks and petrol bombs being thrown 
through the window. There have been lesbian women who've had their children taken away. I met a gentleman during that project who'd had a lobotomy from which he'd never really recovered. There have been women and men because of society's attitudes against them that have uh, ended up getting married or not even realizing their sexuality before getting married, but maybe having children to avoid the shame and then finding their true selves in, in later life, maybe not coming out until much later in, in life. And people who, who are LGBT have often uh, historically moved from their homes to the nearest big city so that they can have some anonymity. So it's their friends become their family. Maybe their family has completely rejected them. Uh, when I was seven years old, uh, my dad uh, tried to commit suicide. Uh, I remember going to visit him at what was then an asylum uh, and he never really recovered and I discovered in later years that when he was unsuccessful in his suicide attempt he came out as gay whether he was gay or not I never really found out he used to speak to me in very homophobic terms and I can understand why now because he had I probably had a lot of fears around me uh, being an open gay man and, and, and the sorts of issues that he'd maybe thought of. Because people had to meet very clandestinely. They'd have to meet in parks or um, places like that. And if people were arrested, because let's not forget, for that, this generation, it was illegal for, for, for men to be homosexual. There, there weren't any legal things against lesbians, mainly because Queen Victoria didn't believe in the existence of lesbians, so they weren't mm. um, legislated against. But men were illegal, so if a gay man was caught, the police might beat him up, they might go through his contact details, they might confiscate his diary and contact and arrest or... Um, you know, barge into the homes of anybody that was in, in the diary. The, so there was a, a real tangible sense of fear. Um, and then, of course, lesbian and gay men went, went through the early days of HIV and AIDS. And with that crisis, they went through significant and sustained bereavements over and over again. Um, I've known gay men who, who, who um, has lost a partner through HIV and AIDS and maybe not allowed to be at the funeral, have their home taken away from them by the deceased family. All these kind of, they may sound very dramatic, but these are, you know, some of the experiences that we may uh, encounter in, in supporting LGBT people. And on a, on a personal level, you know, I was diagnosed, I mentioned, uh, when, when I was 24. By the time I was 25, I had 50 friends that had died through AIDS. I stopped counting at that point. So that gives a kind of, you know, all those cumulative effects of loss, feeling uh, unwanted, feeling that you're bad, feeling that you're a sinner, those things become internalized for a lot of people. And um, I remember mentioning HIV. I was, I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine. I, I set up an oh. HIV charity in Wales, where I'm from, and I was speaking to um, the woman who, who replaced me as, as chair, and we, dis we were discussing a, 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 a fellow person there, and we organized years ago, back in 1996, I think it was, a, a conference about older people and HIV. Mm. And um, one chap talked about, he, he was then officially becoming, in the bracket of Age UK, um, of being an older person and he talked about he'd closed his life down thinking he was dying then in 1996 new combination therapy came about he suddenly had a future again and he described it and it's always stuck with me he said it's like turning my life around on on a um a great big uh trawler a super tanker 
turning it around on a sixpence because this this wasn't what I was pre preparing for. Now I've got to prepare for old age. <laughs> I was talking about him uh, with my friend Alison the other day. He's just turned seventy, and um, so it just goes to show that there are so many issues, you know. And a, a, a colleague who might be on online today was telling me recently about a transgender woman. Who, who was petrified about going into a care home and receiving personal care. And, and she was absolutely petrified that, and this was somebody that had transitioned from being male to female, and she was petrified that she might have personal care provided by a male. Right. She didn't want to see her genitalia seen by a male. Um, and, and she, you know, people that are really afraid and of course, one other th thing to be be aware of is is that which is just generally there is there's so much ageism in society, but that happens within the LGBT community as well. It's not a homogenous group, and and you know with the commercial gay scene, which has always been a, ha a safe haven for people. Now, as as people get older, um, it becomes what has been a safe haven no no longer feels safe for them. I remember an old friend of mine, a lovely chap. Um, who, who would we'd, we'd sometimes have drinks in the pub in the afternoon, and and he drank a lot of gin, and he'd he'd have some gin. I don't know how much money he must have put behind the bar, but the, the music would turn up and up as the time, and he'd he'd finally say, right, at six o'clock, I'm not welcome anymore, and that's always stuck with me, you know yeah. how yeah. this aging. So those are some negatives. I'm going to just mm -hmm. finish off on this section because I think it is important to hear those things. But that's it's not always negative experience. My uncle, uh, Ifted, was um, was in politics. Uh, his partner Christopher was in theatre. He was Maggie Smith's uh, personal assistant, and um, you know they were this very open. A couple, they actually met in a park. They did meet in a park and walked past one another several times and eventually spoke. They had 50 years together and then Chris died. And um, it did retire to, to Brighton and I went to visit him quite, quite regularly. And one, one day I said to him, why do you have two single beds? And he said, well, all of us used to do that because we were always afraid that we would be raided by the police. So we'd, we'd make sure that we had single beds because yeah. we wouldn't be known to be gay because then they would arrest us. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's, I, I suppose what's important to say is, is that, you know, every person will be different and their experiences will be different. So it's important to not, you know, that old trainer's favourite that we've both used, I'm sure, don't assume it makes an ass out of you and me. Yeah. And I think about my... My great grandfather, I remember him going into a care home. And I, I remember, I think it was about 10, he, uh, he, he got married for the second time on his 92nd birthday. Fantastic. Uh, he did, didn't reach 93. But what that made me learn very early on is that we still have a need for intimacy. It's not, you know, people think about. Um, sexuality just being about sex but it's not that and you know his need for intimacy remained at 92 um, and so it would for anybody else who, who's well, whatever their sexuality may be or their gender identity thank you mike some really powerful really powerful examples there i think about people's experiences and as you said you know we could we could have talked about that part I think of our conversation probably all afternoon couldn't we and and you know I know that there is um some of those stories may have been quite upsetting to hear for people that are listening as well and you know just mm. just to say that you know we will myself and Mike can hang around at the end of this session we'll end it formally but if anybody does want to to stay and chat about uh, some of that um and then anything else that that may come up during this session we we can hang out for a little bit after after the yeah, conversation definitely. Formally, formally ends um, and it's not to scare people, it's it's just to help. I thought it was really important to share some of those stories because that is is why, you know, it's not just about saying, you know, we'll, we'll have a rainbow flag in the reception area and that will be it. Tick yeah, the yeah. box. It, yeah. it needs so much more than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that leads us on really to think about 
should we and 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 can we identify LGBT plus residents in in care homes? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my first question is is, is how can we? Because um, they haven't got little signs above their heads. Um, Unless people tell us the information, we're not going to know. So we've got to create the environment where people feel safe and able to share that information. Yeah. Um, so it's not our place to identify and label people. As I always say on training courses, you know, labels are for parcels, not for people yeah. anyway. Um, and will people, you know, the things that I've talked about, will people be willing to tell us if, if they've got those fears? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just remember, and it's the words of Tom Kit would always come to mind for me. You know, once you've met one person with dementia, he said, you've met one person with dementia, and it's the same thing with this community that we're talking about. Not everybody's going to be the same, of course not. Um, so, you know, some people may be very open about it, some people may not, and there's historically been a kind of policy, I think, um, an unwritten policy of don't ask, don't, and they don't tell. But, you know, and I've been to care homes and, and they've said to me, oh, well, we haven't got any of them here. And it's like, well, well how do you know? So it is important to, it is important to monitor um, because, um, you know, we, we will, um, you know, people won't necessarily share the information unless we ask, but we've got to ask in a very sensitive way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say something because I noticed that you've been talking about LGBTQ plus. Mm -hmm. I'm sure lots of people get a bit confused by all these letters. I certainly, yeah. over the years, I personally made the choice not to use the, the Q because it was introduced because politically some people wanted to reclaim the word queer or questioning. Um, but queer was also a pejorative and a precursor to physical attacks. Yes, yeah? Yes, yeah. Every time I've I've been physically attacked for being gay, I've been called queer first. Yeah. So and I only say that here because with if I in a different context, I might use the word the, the letter Q. But with this community, I think they've had a really difficult experience of, of that mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. letter. And yes, we just really end up with yeah. that soup yeah. anyway. That's really helpful, Mike. Thank you for that. Um, so if we're thinking about, you know, what gets in the way, what do you think the key obstacles are really um, in terms of providing this sort of person-centred, person-led, relationship-centred mm. care and support that we're all kind of thriving for, really? What, what in this regard, what do you think are the, the key obstacles? Well, I think that, that it, it's a few years old now, but Stonewall has done some great research on this. Stonewall is, is the sort of campaigning organisation for LGBTQ plus community. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, just, just some of the stats from that report that really struck me, even though it's a few years old, three in five are not confident that social care and support services, including paid services or housing services, will understand their need. Nearly half said they'd be uh, would be uncomfortable being out about their gender or or, uh, or, or um, sexuality to care home staff. Eighty one percent of women and sixty nine lesbian and bisexual women and sixty nine percent of gay and bisexual men said they view their friends as family. So that has an implication. Yeah because it may be the friend that is nearer to being a next of kin than a relative. Yeah. Uh, eight in ten, uh, sorry, I've, 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 I've jumped, no, nine in ten, 89% uh, said that they would, they dislike the, the prospect of moving into a res residential care home. So we've got a bit of a job on our hands before we even get them in, in terms of changing some of the perceptions that, that people may have about how they may be treated in care. 70% um, said they don't feel able to be, that they didn't think they'd be able to be themselves. And 76% uh, are not comfortable 
that they definitely would be treated with dignity and respect in care homes. So, you know, a lot of stats there. Um, yeah. I've made all these notes and I'm, I'll happily send you these. Yeah, yeah that would be really helpful. I think, I think some, I sometimes the stats are a very good place to start, aren't they, when we're developing policy? And yeah. I know that you have a very, you've got a, you've got a particular standpoint on where do we start, haven't you, in terms of, you know, policy development. Definitely, because we've got to, we've got to re realise the other kind of barriers of things that reluctance on the part of managers and some, some managers and some staff to discuss the issue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If you know, I love the worries around not necessarily how will staff treat me, it's about how will other residents treat me. Mm -hmm. um, multicultural staffing means that people come from a range of backgrounds, range of cultures that may have attitudes that are not very inclusive of uh, people who are LGBT plus. Um, for again, a whole other dimension is dementia. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's all those other health concerns that, that additional for lesbian and gay people, breast and prostate cancer, mental health, HIV, etc. So there's a lot of barriers there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, you said it's, it's so much more than, you know, the rainbow flag in the window or whatever, or, you know, the rainbow lanyards or whatever it is that we want to, that we want to wear to demonstrate. It often comes from a very good place, doesn't it? But to demonstrate, you know, that, that we are inclusive, but you know, what, what can we, what, what is it, you know, what are the things that all of us can do to, to, to make a difference, not just to show that we're making a difference, but actually yeah. to make a well, difference. There is, there is some fantastic work going on there. I'm going to give a plug because uh, uh, she's been one of the people that I've been speaking to in preparation for today. Natalie Ra Ravenscroft, hopefully on watching at Belong Care Village, where she's been organising a Silver Pride events uh, the last couple of years. There's so much stuff going on that is really good. Um, but it's, I'm going to go back to that metaphor of the telescope. And yeah. I think we need to look from the other end, you know, rainbow flags and ribbons and lanyards and flags and all those things are great outward sign that we're being inclusive. But we've got to have the infrastructure in place first. It requires yeah. leadership and a, a commitment to sort of a, a process with staff, looking at their own understanding and expectations and interpretation and maybe some of the own, their own biases which they may have mm. and that needs to be dealt with sensitively and in yeah. a non-judgmental way absolutely we, we need to have i would say good policy and strategy uh, for how we're going to demonstrate um, all those things and, and those sort of policies and st strategies need to include things like how are we going to monitor, how are we going to deal with disclosure and confidentiality, how are we going to deal with risk management and bullying if one resident bullies another on the basis of their, yeah. their identity, yeah. uh, what about end of life planning and care, you know, because it may not be a next of kin that needs to be there. Um, it, it may be, you know, a friend that has been there through the entire journey. Yeah. And how we're re recruiting staff, you know, one of one of the things I always say, you know, it's do we ask the question? So, you know, how would you respond if a resident were to tell you that they were LGBT? How would you respond to that? So there's lots of things, and then then I sort of think that it's a process and it's about good quality training that understands the context of that LGBT history that I've shared. It's about a whole home approach. So it shouldn't be the responsibility of those who define themselves as LGBT. Obviously it's how we, how we support our LGBT plus staff, but we can't expect them to be the, the ones flying the flag. Uh, so we need our allies who are not LGBT plus um, to be to be alongside. It's it's even silly things sometimes. So, well, not not silly, but but things that are easy to forget. I do a lot of diversity training, and I remember doing. I, I use a diversity audit, and I was training an organisation years ago now, and and it was um, 
an older people's health condition. If I say what it was, I'll name the charity. And um, the, for their trustees, and the trustees were, were saying, well, yeah, but everybody's welcome. And uh, we went through the audit and one of it, you know, we, we looked at various sections and, and we looked through their publicity and there was nobody under 60. There was nobody that wasn't white. Um, every couple looked as if they were heterosexual couples. And that's not that they were doing that to be excluding. It was just they didn't realise that. Yeah. You know, to be inclusive, we need to create those images on our websites, on our literature. Um, talking to residents about LGBT issues before LGBT residents move into the home. You know, so there is that conversation. Um, and yet, you know, checking out does is, you know, I'm really delighted when I visit care homes for my work and I see a rainbow sticker. I'm not in any way saying don't do it because I go, ah, <laughs> it's me a sign. Mm -hmm. But if, if there's that sticker and I'm an older uh, LGBT person, I see that sticker and I move in and then I've got staff who haven't been trained on these issues that then tell me I'm a sinner. Yeah. Then, then that, yeah. the sticker yeah. just doesn't say anything. So I'd say connect with your local LGBT organisations. I've put, there's lots. Um, and really, really work with, in partnership if you can. I, I'm all for collaboration. And in terms of the activities, you know, which, which many people might have been tuning in to think about the activities. Well, it's like, I'd just say they might need to be one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, it's just putting on a, a Judy Garland sing-along session, uh, thinking that's going to appeal, you know, yeah. not, yeah. not <laughs> love Judy Garland. Um, but it is remembering, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that you know, uh, NAPA's 10 core activity needs. You know, one of them is around cultural needs. And remember that LGBT goes in that need alongside BAME, Black and, and Asian and, and minority ethnic communities. So it's about enabling residents to visit local LGBT venues. Um, I know if if it had gone into a care home, you know, he'd been wanting to go to the to the gay pub because yeah. that's where he could chat and flirt. Yeah. Um, and and it's thinking about yeah, I, I think she talks about Black History Month, but also using LGBT History Month as an opportunity to get in guest speakers, uh, learn about some of the stuff. Um, and, and keeping up those, I'm remembering that the social networks are gonna be very different, very different in terms of how, um, how we got. So when I, when I was a young gay man and I, I went to Cardiff to train to be an actor, um, I was a lodger with, with an older gay couple. They were older in, as in they were in their thirties and I was younger than them. <laughs> They, they were like mentors to me. So it was very important to me um, to try to be a mentor to the next generation up. So my, my, we call him our adopted son, but you know, we had then ended up with a lodger who, who in a way became our adopted son. We mentored yeah. him, it's like a family relationship. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, that's the kinds of things And even going back to Ilted again, you know, went up because Christopher had died, he had this wonderful carer who was more like his wife. She was fantastic. She knew him better than anybody. And she could have easily been assumed to be his wife. Yes. But yeah, because of their connection, the quality of their relationship. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. I'm really conscious we've got lots of chat. I know. And possibly I some, I'm hoping some questions to, to, to have a look at. I'm just going to whiz through and um, if that's okay and see, and so we don't miss anybody or any really important shares, um, lots of hellos from people that, that know us both well. Uh, so hello back to everybody. Um, hello. A point here from, from, from Chris Maddox. Um, I oh, think it's hi, important, Chris. lovely Chris. I think it's important to remember for older LGBT plus people who may be in a care home that homosexuality was a crime when they were young and they had to hide their sexuality. When dementia progresses, they may revert back to when being gay was illegal. 
and become yeah. very frightened to say that they are gay. I think that's a really important point, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> but absolutely, dementia complicates this further, doesn't it? In terms thank of you. yeah, I think it's it's. Thank you, Chris. It's a really important point. I mean, when when I'm training on dementia, I often talk about this part of the brain, the frontotemporal part of the brain. I I call it our social police force because it's the part of the brain that monitors our behaviour and yeah. prevents yeah. us from maybe swearing or, or using a, a racist term we might think it but not say it um, but when that's damaged if that part of the brain is damaged by dementia then people may behave in ways they weren't before and i remember people with in in the early days of hiv with hiv related dementia that would take their clothes off in a public space yeah. uh, or, or urinate in a corner or, or something so we we do need to be aware of that and and there may be, be people because of their dementia that may be very very fearful Absolutely. If they're put into an asylum or arrested and put into prison um and i'm not saying that care homes are prisons but um you know being in, in a different unfamiliar environment could bring back really difficult feelings and emotions Absolutely. And I think if somebody feels safe enough to, to, to share their identity, then with, you know, or, or share a part of themselves with somebody, they may well feel that that person who they've shared that with is able then to respond if they were to share difficult information. And of course, they yeah. may do different things. So it's preparing staff for, to be able to respond appropriately as well, isn't it? If some of those yeah. difficult um, personal experiences are shared. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I mean about, you know, having a rainbow badge is is, is great to show, yeah, I'm a, a, approachable, but if then we have to deal with something, you know, so we, we've got to have the, the right training and support to be able to handle those kinds of situations appropriately. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just from Susie, Mike, Susie says, for LGT Plus Month, I held a session where we spoke on the changes over the years for the LGT, uh, LGBT Plus community and how we have changed to be inclusive. We talked about Stonewall, it was a great discussion, and residents who chose to take part, um, and every, as residents chose to take part, which is fantastic, isn't it? That, that they were given that opportunity to, to share. Brilliant. I've just. I think that's, that's the great thing with that event, that yes. is that it, it gives an opportunity to, to make it just part of the year's activities without singling out, you know, those who may be LGBT. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, yeah. Um, I'm just wanting to whiz through some of these other ones. Um, from Ladder to the Moon. Uh, hello, oh. Ladder to the Moon. I'm hello, interested Ladder in the winning moon. groups online. My aim is that staff would have conversations with any residents who they might think of, uh, who might think identify as LGBTQ+. My intention is to make these groups creative um, to get the conversation going. What a, that, what a good idea. Great idea. Fantastic. So that people I remember that, that you know, there are groups in the community that that um, that that can help as well. Um, you know, and I, I'm all for intergenerational work. You know, and and there's thankfully now we've got support groups for young LGBT plus people, and you know maybe some of them would love to become a a, a regular visitor, befriender, and come into the home. Absolutely. You know, so be creative. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we have uh, some discussion about safe to be me. A couple of people have referenced very important document, very helpful document. Um, do you want to just? I was, I was, going, to, I was going to give it a plug. Um, it's it's an incredible resource. Um, it's available as a PDF, so so it's going to be in amongst all the resources that I've put together. For Napa to send out today, it's some really great case studies and uh, checklists in it, which I think are incredibly useful. The other thing that I'd mention is I, I talked about opening doors earlier. They've got something that they call Pride in Care, which, if you like, it's a it's like a quality standard um, that you go through an assessment process to show that. Um, you know, you've you've gone through some of the things that we've talked about in terms of policies and and training. So there's a flyer for that in amongst the resources and and yeah. the website. Excellent, thank you for that, Mike. I think that probably sort of brings us brings us to the end of of the time that we've got. Is there anything else, Mike? Any kind of parting comments 
um, that you would like to, to leave our listeners with today? I, I would say, you know, th th this is called, um, no, put it the wrong way around, but this, the, you know, Sal Sally's document, Safe to Be Me. Um, we, we've, I suppose we've got to, we've got to make sure I feel safe to be me and then they'll be free to be me. Um, and, you know, yeah. that, that takes time um, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's, it's, it's a gradual, gradual process. Please don't try to rush it. Take yeah. your time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because it's a process. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And just to say that um, as Mike is a consultant, obviously works very closely with NAPA, also Meaningful Care Matters, and does stuff on his, lots and lots of stuff on his own with a range of different organisations across um, health, housing and social care. If anybody would like to get in touch with Mike and explore this further, um, if you are looking to develop your policies, your training offers, etc., please have a look at his website, Mike Phillips Training. Very straightforward to remember. Um, and um, when we send out the resources after today, we'll make sure that we add in Mike's email address as well so that you can contact him directly if you've got any, any other thoughts or you'd like to explore this further with him. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been a, Thank you. Uh, a lovely afternoon. Again, my coffee's gone cold again. I bet yours has too, hasn't it? <laughs> Isn't it always the dog the has way? started barking. I'm amazed my dogs haven't barked all the way through this. <laughs> They've learned to be silent really, at the really right time. <laughs> thanks, thanks to, to everybody for, for tuning in and watching this afternoon as well. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. Just to remind everybody about the Napa helpline as well. So please, you know, if, if you are, you know, if you want to chat anything through, if you've got any questions, you can always contact the helpline um, as well as as well as directly uh, get in touch directly with Mike. So thank you all very, very much and we'll be around for a few minutes if anybody wants to hang out and ask any questions um we're here other than that we'll we'll sign off for now thank you all for being here Bye. take care bye-bye Bye. -bye. Bye.